a quick introduction of every, well, maybe what I'll let you do, if those of you who can, I'll let you kind of introduce yourselves briefly and then tell us just a, a little bit about the project that you're currently working on or that you're wanting to work on so we can kind of all get a big, uh, so I can get a bigger picture of what everybody is is hoping to to accomplish. Cheryl, do you do you mind starting? Lene has been trying to help me write my life story for well, probably five years. <laughs> we go lunch together and she says, now do this, now do this, now do this. And I never quite finish, but I want to have it ready for Christmas this year. And so that's what I want to do. I, I have about 20 pages, but and that's plenty long for me, but I don't want to miss anything and I really want to do a good job. So uh, that's that's my project. Okay. Kathy, how about you? That's great. This is Kathy Whitaker, everyone. Yeah, I'm Kathy Whitaker, and um, I I haven't decided on what project I'm going to do. Lene helped me do my father's missionary journal last year, and and we printed it and bound it and gave it to my family for Christmas. So I was thinking I was going to take this year off until she <laughs> invited me to do another project. So. Um, I, both of my parents are 93 and they're still living. And so I don't have histories on either one of them. So I feel kind of compelled to work on um, kind of both of their histories to try and get them done this year, at, you know, in a short version. Um, but I also do recognize that at some point in time, I need to do my own as well. So, but I think I, think I might um, focus on my parents' personal histories this year and I'll probably start with my mom just because I did my dad's last year great okay okay Jonetta but do you she want doesn't to... know that yet she doesn't know that yet you haven't <laughs> she doesn't because I just made that decision right now okay <laughs> <laughs> okay let's hear from Jonetta and Cherry maybe you can both unmute and kind of because it sounds like you're working on a simultaneous project, Sherry and Jonetta, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing all of your names right. Correct me if I'm not getting it right. Um, they're working on a project together, unless I'm mistaken. Does that sound right? So it sounds like everybody's kind of like, there aren't any of us who are, with the exception of Cheryl, who are, and maybe Kay, I don't know for sure what Kay's plan is to work on, but it sounds like most of you are kind of thinking in terms of like helping a family member. Um, get something done. And and I think that's a, a wise decision, particularly if you're in a situation like Kathy is where her parents are 93, like how much more time does she have to get first person documents in place? Okay, thanks, Kay. She's doing her own personal history. So this will be fun. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll kind of just, I think what I will try to do is just teach you basic concepts that you can apply to anybody's history. And the reason I'm doing this class is that I've I've worked now for about, I don't know, maybe seven to eight years helping people with personal histories <clears throat> and kind of tackle the technology, the, the difficulties in getting something from out of your head to into a printed document that you can share with your loved ones. <clears throat> and it's not an easy process. <clears throat> Pardon me. And and so one of the difficulties I found, I, I was a, a book editor for a while for a, a local publisher, and I found I never, I, they would send me out as an acquisitions editor, that was my title, and I would go out and find authors who wanted to write books. I never once had anybody that I asked say, no, I have no interest in writing a book. Anybody that I ever talked to, and I would say, have you got a book in you? Like, this is an interesting thing that you do for a living, or have, have you got, do you feel like you have a book inside of you that you would like to write? I've never had anybody tell me no. Oddly enough, for people with personal histories, some of the time I they say, well, I, I just don't, there's just nothing interesting enough about me to write about. I think that's our number one, uh, the thing that holds us back. We all feel like we're just pretty basically uninteresting individuals. And there's not a lot about us that's worth, <laughs> that's worth uh, documenting and saving for our descendants. And so I think since you're in this class, it's probably not something that I have to talk you through. I might have to talk you through writing your own history because we're we're pretty we're pretty confident about 
no, I want to, I want to record some of my grandmother's legacy and make sure it gets passed on or my parents' legacy. But we don't very often kind of put ourselves in that number one position. And I'm not trying to talk you out of your plan because I think you're probably inspired to do the thing that, that is, you know, if the feeling of I want to do this is coming to you, there's a reason for that and you should follow that impression. But I also want to encourage you as part of this process to really commit <laughs> that at some point you're going to do this work for yourself as well. And the reason for that is that you are the only person on the planet who can tell your story accurately. The difficulty with writing somebody else's story for them is that you have to depend on documents that they left behind, or you have to depend on your memories of that person. And either and your memories of that person are are fallible. Like they're your version of like, would you let your husband write your personal history for you? Like this is a person closest to you. Would you trust him to accurately record <laughs> your your life story? Well, no, I, I, none of us none of us would. And as much as I love my grandmother and she loves me, um, and she did actually request that I write my grandpa's personal history for him, but I I can't do that in a way that he could have done it in a, as a, in, as an authentic a version as he could have done. Now that said, I think there's a lot of value if your loved one has already passed on to you doing the work to preserve what you can for them. And if um, Sherry and Jonetta, are you okay if I like disclose just a little bit of your story here to share with everybody? Okay, because I think this is a perfect example of, um, of why doing family histories for other people are so fun. Now, why can't I share my screen? Oh, there it is. Share screen. I was gonna clean off my desktop before we got started and I didn't get it done. So I apologize for my mess. Um, so I've got here a copy of Clyde Wright's history that Sherry had her father, maybe Sherry, you tell the story. How did you come into, how did you come to have access to this? Um, my dad was on oxygen and our mom had died. And uh, I asked him to, I took over a little recorder and I says, I need you to record your history. Well, he'd been called as a bishop at that time. And so he was kind of taking things like that a little bit more serious, you know, and like I went back over there and he didn't want to write, he didn't want to record it, but he was writing it. And so he got up to the time he was 14 years old and it is so fun to read. He's quite a character. So anyway, okay. that's, that's the background. Thank you. I want to just share like this, this, these first three paragraphs are so, such a great example of why this kind of thing I feel like is really important as part of what we do in, in our families. <clears throat> I'm going to skip to chapter or to paragraph two. Clyde's father, Chester, I hope you can see that. Maybe I can make it a little bigger. Clyde's father, Chester, was a part-time ranger, so they had a phone that the phone line was strung from Moab, mostly in the tops of trees. <laughs> Clyde wrote, I remember sitting on the porch with my dad's hired hand. His name was Ira Fillmore. And he was making me a wooden whistle and the lightning struck and it shot down that telephone line and it struck Ira and knocked him out and scared me. I was about four years old. I remember my mother running out of the house screaming. I guess I must have screamed and scared her as she thought I had been hit. I'm going to guess this is probably his earliest childhood memory. Like if he went back in his mind and he searched, what's the very earliest thing I can remember? I'm going to guess that's why this story stuck out to him. Yes, and then so this is just an example like this 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 document is several pages long but Clyde also writes I remember that we used to go up the creek to an old bachelor's house and get raspberries in the summer he always had gum for us little kids he would store it on his hat and pick it off for us kids it didn't matter if it had been had been chewed once or twice but I know that we used to like to go there his name was Bob Deffendorf which is an awesome name I remember one of my favorite spots was a place about four miles east of our house. There were many springs and a lot of craking aspen, and we could, would go there on Sundays, as, and we would picnic most of the day. 
I do remember we would go by wagon. The big boys would ride horses and a mule. They put me on the back of the saddle and they started to run the horses and I fell off and it knocked me out. So you see, I have an excuse for being like I am as I know I fell on my head in a pile of rocks. Mm -hmm. So like if that, if those two paragraphs were the only thing that any of us could ever access about Clyde, don't we have a, an, an amazingly more rich vision of who Clyde is than we did before we started reading his history just a second ago? So, and we also notice that Clyde is a natural storyteller. His lived experience, his lived life experience is interesting. It's very, you know, I, I mean, I guess getting struck by lightning is <laughs> it's not an everyday occurrence, but it's but it's really fun to read and it's interesting. And I would I would submit that you've got within your own life story similar kinds of experiences that will not only be, that will just be plain engaging for people, fun for them to listen to. But beyond that, we have the additional level of being able to, um, what the research tells us is as we lay down and create these family stories, these family narratives for our children, those family narratives actually help anchor them. They help give them a sense of belonging, a sense of self, and most importantly, a sense of uh, uh, an increased as resilience. They're, like they can document this with research that as the younger generation learns these family stories, something about knowing that my progenitors went through difficult things and they survived it, it helps our younger children have a sense of resilience that they would lack otherwise. And so that's one of the, a couple of the reasons why I feel pretty passionate about, about, you know, what I do when I'm helping people, because I feel like if any little snippet of information that you can leave behind for your, your family members and your loved ones has the potential to, to improve their lives and bless them, particularly in times of difficulty. Um, and maybe I'll share some of the stories of how that has happened in my own life as we, as we proceed forward. But um, our task today is that I want each one of you to be thinking of a Genesis story. And what I mean by a Genesis story, I'll go back to my screen here again. Um, this is this is my blog. <laughs> and I've put this up here and I'll share these links with you. But this will kind of just be a running uh, discourse of how I would start with a story and, and we'll take it step by step. There are, you know, six to 12 individual steps that you can go through as you're building your story. And you can use different technologies. You can write your story in different ways. But the, the hardest, the hardest part is starting. Like that's the, if I can get people over that hump, even if they only record, right, Sherry, even if you only recorded he what he wrote maybe three four pages of the final document typed out but it fleshes out his life in such an a powerful way that we would not have her family would not have any access to had he not taken the time on that afternoon or whenever he got started to sit down and physically write out some of his memories so i want to share you uh, with you just this little video this is don ray He's one of the clients. I actually worked with his wife. I gotta pause in for a minute and see if I can get this to expand. What? It thinks it is full screen. Okay, that might be as big as I can get it. Can you see it? Okay. Oh, there it goes. All right. So Don Ray, I was actually working on his wife's history, and this is a perfect example of. She said, "Oh, I'm just going to write the history for both of us because he doesn't want to write his history." <laughs> and I like I knowing what I know about women writing their husband's histories for them I I said okay that's great but when when we finally got together to do some some editing one day I said Don Ray can I just take you out in the yard and, and record a couple of stories with you so this is all we have of of when, when we talk about family history we'll talk about primary and secondary and tertiary documents primary documents are the ones you produce yourself like this is a letter I wrote this is a talk I gave. This is something I wrote in my journal. A secondary source would be 
Cherry remembering a story about her grand about her father and writing that down from his point of view. Okay, so this is all we've got from Don Ray, but I wanted to just share just this much with you. Um, he's out in his garage. It's in 1968, Mustang convertible 302. But when I uh, first dated Nedra, I was driving that uh, 49 that I had restored convertible, 49 Ford Duke that you saw in the picture. And uh, then I traded that in and bought a baby, a yellow uh, old Super 88, 53 Super 88. The convertible hooked her, especially when I put her diamond I gave it to her on for the prom, and uh, her diamond the corsage was a bird of paradise. That's why I love these plants. That's the bird of paradise, and so there in the corsage on the beak of the, the flower was her diamond, and her mother saw it before she did, so that was interesting. Everyone else was sporting her orchids. And gardenias, and then we had a bird of paradise, and everybody had to know what that was. There again, not the usual, not the common, the unusual. And I gave her that ring. She wasn't sure. She kind of gave it back. So I put it on the gold chain that I had my football letter on, from football. I put it on the gold chain and hung it over the rear view mirror on the convertible. So there we'd go down the road and there it was swinging. It wasn't long she was afraid I'd lose it, so she took it back for safekeeping. Okay, there's Don Ray. All right, what do you know about Don Ray now that you didn't know about him two minutes ago? That is a two minute long video. Well, he liked cars. And he had he had a flair for um, dramatic. Like, yeah, dramatic. You know. Okay. Anything yeah. else? I also noted that he voted for Donald Trump from his hat. He's <laughs> that hat on before we started the video because he knew it would tick off certain members of his family, <laughs> <laughs> which is a fun part of the story, right? Okay, so that's yeah. okay, that's good. Yeah. Uh, that's so he was definitely leaving a message. He was leaving a message. He loved his wife. He loved his wife. Like, and I, she wasn't sure she wanted to marry him to start with. You get a you get a sense of uh, you get a flavor of what his sense his sense of humor was like. Yeah. You get a little bit. You you see some of his mannerisms. I don't. I think that for me, the most important part of it is we've preserved the sound of his voice. Like they have access now to even just, it's only two minutes long, but now we have access to the sound of grandpa's voice. I don't know if any of you have this situation where you will call your, I call my parents house sometimes when I know my mom's not around just to hear my dad pick up on the answering machine. He's been gone two and a half, two and a half years now. And and just just having that couple of minutes of hearing his voice again is really really sweet. So if we don't, even if so, this is to say, if we're only preserving your your personal history in print, that's that's great. I hope that at some point you will take some time to preserve the sound of your voice for your grandchildren as well. I think that will be something that they will appreciate. So, so what we're gonna do here today, I know you're interested in the nitty gritty of how, of how to do this. So we're gonna start, all of you are gonna start and you can choose to tell your own story or you can tell somebody else's story. I want you to choose a Genesis story. Well, a Genesis story is a story of a beginning and it can be, for example, let's see if I can pull these up again. Uh, any kind of fresh new beginning, your first day of elementary school, uh, the day you met your best high school friend, the first time you glimpsed your significant other, your first date, you can tell about uh, 
how you met them. That's a Genesis story. Your first job, the first time you ended up in the hospital. Um, we're going to skip the birth of your first child, unless that's a story you really want to tell, because that's pretty, that's something I think you'll cover anyway. Your first attempt at a favorite hobby. It could be something as, as weird as your first trip to the dentist, if you feel like there's a story about some first like that, that's interesting. The day you had an idea for a business you could start. Um, what happened the day you left home for the first time when you moved out of your childhood home? The day you learned to read, all of those are different examples of different kinds of um, Genesis stories. So I'm gonna give you just a second or two to think about what story you might tell as your Genesis story. And I'm going to record you, you're all being recorded. And then um, between next week, between now and the next time we meet, I will get that transcribed for you. So you'll have the beginning of your, your own personal history started. Um, Cherry and Jonetta, if you want to think about a Genesis story that involves your father, that might be a good thing. Um, the first time he took you out hunting for uh, turquoise or the first time, I know just a little bit about their history so I can bring that one up. Um, any any memory that you might have with him that feels like really an early memory would work um, if you're writing his story. And Kathy, same with your you, if you want to remember something about your parents so that we're getting a story down imprint that will be useful in your upcoming project. And then my goal would be to help each of you succeed at finishing this project by mid-October-ish or sooner. You can do it if you want to. If we can finish by mid-October, that gives us time to get it printed in time for Christmas. So, all right. Does anybody already know what story you want to tell? Who can just jump right in? I was just thinking about the first time I, I remember my dad telling me that he loved me. Okay, let's hear it. Well, I they had moved from Moab to Fallon, Nevada, and uh, I'd spent the night with my sister, and I'd come home like about 6.30 in the morning because uh, I'd got stuck out with, I'd gone out with a guy, and I got stuck out there, and he wouldn't take me home because I wouldn't do what he wanted to do, <laughs> and so I finally got him to take me to her place, and then she took me home, but dad was coming out the door, um, and I was, as I walked up to the door and he grabbed me and he said, he said, you know, I love you and you're my little girl, you know. And I was probably almost 19 years old. What do you think prompted that for him in that moment? Why was that moment different than all the other moments in your 19 years before then? Because I think they were worried about what I was doing. <laughs> honest with you you know really so they didn't know what had gone on but it was it was a rough transition from Moab to Nevada so that's a great story I like imagine I imagine there are a lot of us who grew up or a lot of a lot of people who grew up with fathers you know who had lived through World War II and the Great Depression and that just wasn't in the vocabulary we didn't they didn't know we needed to hear it it just wasn't what fathers did, so. He was a good dad though, huh, Janetta? Yes. Okay. That's a great story. Yeah. Anybody else have a Genesis story in mind? And you I can all, I'm... go ahead, Cheryl. I think I'm gonna tell the story of the first time I met my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Charles and I had met at church and he had asked me to be on the missionary committee. He was, he was called to be the missionary chairman. He had only been back from his mission for a week. And, and uh, so then he asked the bishop if I could be on his committee. Well, I thought it was a committee, but it was only the two of us. And so on a Sunday evening, he asked me to go. He invited me to his house to have a snack with his mother and I thought the whole committee was going to be there but I, it was the whole committee me and him but I remember his mother I and I mean he was so cute he was really a cute handsome man and uh and I already had a crush on him but it, you know it 
wasn't going to go any place. And then his mother walked down the stairs and she was beautiful, beautiful. And I thought, well, that kills that. I'll never have a chance with this guy because his mother <laughs> is so beautiful. And so I, I, as time went on, I found out that not only was she beautiful, she was terribly domineering and fussy and, but, and overbearing. And so that was the reason he liked me because I wasn't any of those things. But anyway, just the first time she was so beautiful, I remember. Do you remember, um, did you ever watch the Golden Girls? She was Rose. She looked like Rose and she was dizzy like Rose. Anyway, so that's what I think I'll start. Kathy, have you got any ideas? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, this is more my experience, but it involves both of my parents and my earliest memory of them. Um, we lived in um, a little community called Glendale, California, and we had just moved there. And I was probably three or four. Um, my aunt and cousins lived next door because she was going through a divorce. And so she had two small children. And so I think my mom kind of helped, you know, have a place just for her to have family nearby. Um, and I remember having um, little, I remember a couple of incidents there. One was in the little um, blow up plastic swimming pool, playing, messing around and playing with my cousins in the, in the swimming pool in the summer. One was, um, it seems like I was always underfoot. And so during those days, you know, you had to strip the wax off the floor and then re-wax it. And so she sent me outside to be with my dad while he washed the car and locked the doors. And I was so mad that I got locked out of the house. I just was, I mean, it wasn't that you know, I had a trike to play with or toys or, but just the fact that I could not go back in the house was just so discomforting to me. And um, I remember just banging on the door and just throwing a fit and having my dad just say, you know, come wash the car with me, come play in the water and just not wanting to have anything to do with it. And um so I think that 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 kind of set the tone for my, um, you know, my personality, knowing that when my <laughs> mom had work to do, she did not want me around because I was probably um, more demanding. I don't remember, you know, playing independently. You know, I always wanted to just be around what she was doing. I remember standing on the stool this little kitchen while she was canning or making something and it was hot and, and, you know, and I was, I'm sure I was in the way, but I just wanted to be there. I didn't want to do anything, but I just wanted to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I had, we, we lived down the street from the little elementary school where I went to kindergarten and there was a, a preschool there that was a, um, a Christian preschool and I had a little friend down the street and she invited me to go to the little Methodist preschool with her. I remember my mom let me go one time and then I came home and told her what they had taught me and she pulled me out, wouldn't let me go back again. I was so mad at that. And um and and going down to visit this little friend and having um toast with sugar on it. And I thought that was the best thing in the world. And so I came back and told my mom that we should have toast with sugar on it. And, she, and so she made a little bit of cinnamon sugar that we could have cinnamon sugar on. So, so, so that's kind of my, my first memories are associated with the house and the street that I lived on and the people that were there. Um, Jonetta, I think you're the only one that hasn't had a chance to share if you'd like to, besides Kay, who seems stuck. We'll get your story next time. Well, I'm not sure. The only thing I can think of right now, I'm under pressure, so realize this, that the 
I was going to school at Stevens Henniger in Salt Lake and Cherry and David were overseas. I think it was it was Guam and David was in the Navy and she was having trouble with the uh, I don't know. I can't remember what were you having trouble with. Anyway, mom, mom got on the plane and went over to see her. And so that left dad at home. And he was never one to really get a card or do anything. It was always either Cherry or I, if, if there was a birthday or anything that got mom's card and her gifts, et cetera. But it didn't matter what we got, just as long as it was good. He didn't care. But um, when she was gone, I was, they were sending me money and dad wrote a little note, just said something. I can't even remember. I went looking for it the other day and I, I know it's in my stuff somewhere, but I can't remember what it said, but it was something like, here's the money. Your mom's not here. You know, something really dry. And then he said, this is your crazy dad. And it was the only written thing I've ever had from my dad. Mm. It was pretty neat. And I was really upset when I can't find it, but I know it's in there. I don't think I have anything. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to give you a little bit of hope. Here, I'm going to show you this. This came up. <laughs> um, I will I will talk about some of these women later on. I, somehow I got entrusted with this. Do any of you have like something like this in your house that... Different, different box, but yeah, <laughs> and a lot bigger. Yeah. yeah, I have multiples of these. This is the problem with kind of like there's usually one family historian that gets pegged in every family, and yeah. I'm I'm happy that it's me, but it also it also creates like these burdens of clutter that I'm like, ah, oh, is this important or is this not? But I do I will share. I found just this week. I don't know if you can see it. It's a letter written in year 1928 by my great great grandmother um and somebody had stuck it in this box i assume my grandma saved it because it's kind of mixtures of both sides of my grandpa and my grandma's family's like old letters so this one this particular one written in 1928 as far as i know this is the only primary document in existence of my grandmother, Amelia Thorne Johnson, who lived in the home. She and her husband built the home that my parents live in. Um, and, and so like, I can't tell you how fun it was to find a copy of her handwriting. And it's so sweet. She says, um, I'm so slow in answering your letter, but I have been too upset to write. It's, it's dated October 31st, 1928. And I was like, why would she be too upset to write? And then the next line, November 1st, you see how far I got, just could not write it. And then her letter continues. It is just one year ago tonight since you and the family arrived home. It seems only yesterday. And yet some other times it seems ages. And this letter goes on. And I was like, what in the world was she so upset about? And it finally dawned on me. Oh, so I got on family search and sure enough, my great grandfather had died on October 31st, 1927. So here she is writing this letter exactly one year later and is still feeling so, so much sorrow and so much grief that she cannot even write about it. And I think just knowing that one little thing about my great grandmother ex expanded my vision, my my brain's vision of her in a way that, well, of course we want that letter preserved, not only because it's the only example we have of her handwriting, the only primary document that we have that we know of that's in her writing, but it also tells a story about her and about what she went through at a really difficult time in her life. And I guess I'm saying that to give you hope. <laughs> there might be somewhere in somebody's shoebox and somebody's shelf the, you know, the, the document from your father that will really be a treasure to you someday. And hopefully, I think part of what I have, I have felt like a, it's, it's odd to call it a sense of mission, because this is only one piece of many missions I have in my life, but but helping people figure out, okay, how do we sort out the wheat and the chaff? Do we even know, like, somebody thought that letter was important enough to stick it in a shoebox, but they didn't have any way to preserve it for the rest of the family other than to stick it in a shoebox. You and I 
have technological options that make it possible for us to make that available to a lot of people. But technology being what it is, it only takes one mishap in that, you know, scan the image ceases to exist. Mm -hmm. So nothing's nothing's for sure, but we can do the very best we can to preserve what we can and look at how can we preserve things differently so that so that I, I increase the, the chances that it will survive for another, what are we almost a hundred years later past 1928. So, and there are letters in this box. The oldest I have found are from the 1880s. So wow. who knows why, who saved them or why? All I know is nobody but me has access to them right now. And, and that if I just leave them in this shoe box, chances are high that my children will not will not have time to deal with them and they will get destroyed or thrown away chances are high they won't you know chances are reasonably high that all the stuff i have around me i mean the stuff i have in my home is going to be overwhelming to them and they will have to make decisions quickly when they clean out my house and some things are just going to get chucked and i would guess a shoe box of old letters might not hold enough interest to any of them that they would take the time to preserve it. And so one of the things that I feel like we can do is at least archive this information. Whatever exists for our families that is still out there, we can archive it and we can do our best to preserve it. And we have no control over what happens to it after we've done that. But if we do it the right way, we, we I think we improve our chances of preserving it for future generations so that someday, um, the great granddaughter, who's also named Amelia, can find a letter her great 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 grandmother wrote many years before, and it will give her a connection to somebody that will be powerful and important to her. I like the idea of that, so I'm willing to do some of the work, the tedious work, to make it happen. And it is still tedious work. It's not as tedious as it was 25 years ago to do family history, but it's it's still not easy. It will get. The, the technologies you're going to learn from me five years from now will be outdated. You'll have to learn it again. But in the meantime, some of the things that you would lose, um, conversations with 93-year-old parents, for example, if, we, if you don't document them now, if you don't get them on whatever version of technology exists now, they won't exist for anybody. And so we do the best we can to just capture some moments. And and I love to show this video of Don Ray because it's it's two minutes long. It's all we captured of him. Maybe his family has other stuff. But even if that was all you ever had about Don Ray, it would give you a connection to him as a human being. And I think it would make you feel, um, if you were one of his descendants, like you knew him in a, in a way you couldn't have otherwise. And I think that that's a powerful reason to just start and... I would encourage you, like, I'll send you the, the post, the blog post, but maybe this week, if you'll take your smartphone, if you haven't already done it, if you're writing out your history by hand, like you're typing it out and you're comfortable with typing, that's great. That's a good way to do it. But I would hope that maybe sometime during the coming week, if you can think of a story of some kind that you was is you think is going to be powerful for your descendants, um, and you will sit yourself down. I'll show you my little tripod. I actually have a couple of these. I mean, this is a this is a twelve dollar investment. You can just have somebody hold the phone for you. I like using a tripod because you get a nice still photo that way, which is a lot more fun to watch than a jiggly photo. But um, put your phone on a tripod or have someone hold it. And I think you all know how to do this. You go to your photos app on your device and. You're going to select, you're going to take a video of yourself. Once you push stop, now you've got that story recorded. You have your voice, you have your mannerisms, you have a story about yourself. And if that's the only thing you ever do, you'll have something. Now your children and your grandchildren are recording videos of you all the time, but they're not recording this kind of stuff. Your heart felt like, I want to tell you this Genesis story and I want you to know why it was important to me that my father told me he loved me. I want you to know, you know, something about me that I've never told you before. So that's your homework assignment for this week is to take your smartphone, 
and sit down and record just something and then find, and we'll talk about what, what you would do just to store that later on. Um, ultimately, I think your grandchildren are, are going to be much more likely to ingest your story in video form because it's how they're being raised. That is not to say that you only do video. I think most the easiest way to preserve your story is in written form, in a book, in a document that you can save on family search, on and it's some kind of archival system that you can preserve the written document. But in order to interest your grandchildren and your great grandchildren who are highly visual learners, we're going to have to start to simplify our stories into two or three or four minute snippets and preserve them in a way that they can ingest them. And I feel like I like to use the term it's a movie trailer, like, right? Like <laughs> when I when I help people write their histories, I will will end up with a, a, a hundred page long book. And then I will quite often put a QR code in the back with just the one little video story that we videotaped and and put together. It's it's the movie trailer. It's the I just think I've got Nedra's in here. I can show you exactly what it looks like. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if you can see that, this QR code will take you to a story of Nedra telling about how she started her garden. So it's just a three or four minute long video of how she became a gardener. And she and her husband ran a nursery from their home for 40 years. So it was a moment, her Genesis story of what happened the day I decided to start selling flowers. And it'll, but it'll, it's a, it's just a preservation of, of one story. They may not ever like care about all the rest of this long enough to sit down and read it until they're in their fifties or sixties. And this kind of thing settles as important to them. But right now as children, as teenagers, I can, I can start the interest level by, by turning it into a video story. So that's why I want you to work on a video story. I may. Like, yeah. I want to know, I, I have a very distinct lack of technology. When they click on that QR code, where is that movie trailer? It depends. So on, on this particular one, it's saved to my YouTube channel. Um, you can, I, I'm happy to save your story to my YouTube channel. I think probably... And we'll talk about some of this later on when we're talking about photo preservation. And um, like, this is the this is a kind of a, a tricky place because video takes up so much more memory space than any other technology we currently have. You're not you can't download a video to Family Search and have it saved. And if you put it on YouTube, as soon as you die, who knows what happens? You know, when I die, who knows what will happen to my YouTube channel? I don't yet have an answer for how that will be preserved. Um, even if I have a DVD of it, nobody has a DVD player to play it on. So yeah. video is tricky. It's not a it's not a solution. But for now, we'll use the technology that we have, trusting that it's going to be coming for us in the future that will make it easier for us to preserve it. And I think can you upload it to Family Search with a QR code? Video, you could you'll upload the QR code to Family Search. You can't load video to Family Search yet, unless something's changed in the last month. It oh. could have Roots Tech. They're putting out new stuff all the time. Um, one of the funnest ways, and we can talk about this. I can, I'll, let me show it to you really quickly because this might be a good way, a secondary option. If you don't want to record a video, this is a good secondary option for you to record the sound of your voice. I'm going to share my screen. This is a photo of my dad as a temple worker, and I will play. This is my my voice. I have photos on here that I had him narrate what's going on. This is my story. I hope you'll be able to hear it okay. This is a picture of Grandpa Jim wearing the white suit that he wore as an ordinance worker in the temple. Um, I would stay with him on Wednesday mornings while Grandma Joyce was at the Family History Center helping out at BYU, and then she would come home from BYU and pick him up and they would go to the temple together. And on this particular day, this is um, as grandpa's dementia was getting a little bit more pronounced, he went to get dressed to go to the temple and came out all dressed in his white suit. And I just couldn't help um, snapping a picture because I thought he looked so celestial. 
I still love this picture of him. Just that short. It's preserved a memory of him and my memory of him. And of course, my mom was really ticked when she got <laughs> home. She had to wait for him to change back into his regular suit. I finally talked her into just taking him in his white. I'm like, look, mom, the people at the temple are going to understand. It's it, this, it was the last time he went to the temple. It was the last time that he he had enough cognition that he could go and sit at the ordinance desk and participate at the temple. But I I loved that moment and I wanted to capture it and I felt important to share the story behind the photo. So this is this is on family search and I I the 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 stuff on family search um the church is is being very careful with their backup systems and their redundancy systems and much of this is literally stored in a granite vault. I don't know of anything else that I feel more secure about currently in terms of preserving and archiving information than I do putting it on family search. I think others ancestry and my heritage and some of the others are going to be just as good. They will have to that's like that's their job and they'll they'll be that good but for now, this is this is one I feel comfortable with. And if nothing else, it's out there and hopefully somebody else will care about how to update it to a better technology later if that's necessary. So okay. So yeah, maybe that would that could be idea number two. If you don't want to record a, if your technological skills are not such that you want to record it on your phone, go upload a, a photograph to Family Search and just leave a two or three minute. Um, story about that photograph and and your voice is preserved that's the goal for this week preserve your own voice sound good as we go on i will teach you how we take a recording and, and turn it into a document that's that's what i that's the the method that i typically use is i sit with someone with my video camera and i record them for four five six nine hours telling their stories we transcribe those and those become these books. The difficulty with that system is it's 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 clunky and it depends on my availability. And I can only help one or two people a year do a story this way, where if I can teach you to do it for yourself, you can get yours done and then you can go on and help other people do it. So I can maximize, I can maximize um, productivity <laughs> if I can teach you to be able to do this for yourself. And the technology is not so complicated that that you will that you will not be able to figure it out. There's enough easy to use technology out there now that we can we can teach you how. There's just a few little hoops to get through, and that's the purpose of this class. <laughs>